Great to see everyone. I know it's the beginning of the semester and everybody's frantically hunting for classes, so I especially appreciate your being here today. Um, I'm really pleased to invite, uh, introduce John Whittle, who is a professor and chair of software engineering in the Department of Computing at Lancaster University. Uh, his background is software engineering and human-computer interaction research, but in the last six years, he's taken a keen interest in interdisciplinary research, which is what he'll be speaking to about to us today, speaking to us about today. <laughs> um, he's led five major interdisciplinary research projects funded to about five million pounds. Um, and he's, through these projects, he's learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work when trying to bring researchers together from different disciplinary backgrounds. I think any of us who spent any time in the iSchool know that that can be a challenge. <laughs> Um, John has a PhD from the University of Edinburgh, and he worked at NASA Ames Research Center just down south here for six years where he led an applied research in software modeling. Uh, he was also an associate professor at George Mason University in Virginia, and he's taught in India as well, and he just gave this very talk this afternoon to Tappan's class. Apparently he went to meet with Tappan and Tap said, oh, you should speak to my students. And so he's going to give it today to us for the second time. Thanks so much, John. All right. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Oh. You haven't heard what I'm going to say yet. You shouldn't applaud just yet. You know. um, yeah, so I, 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 I'm a bit of a lapsed computer scientist, just to tell you where I'm coming from. Um, so if you, if you rewind about uh, 10, 15 years when I was doing my PhD, I was a kind of hardcore computer scientist. Um, working in artificial intelligence. In fact, I'm originally a mathematician, and my PhD was all about trying to get computers to do mathematics by themselves, which is obviously quite challenging. Um, and as I've got older, and I guess I've mellowed out a little bit, and I've moved around uh, different countries, I've gradually got softer, um, and I've learned to appreciate the value of, of working with people rather than just machines. Um, and I've been spending a lot of the last five years working with people from all kinds of different disciplines, including sociology, psychology, arts and design, uh, various sciences. Um, why I do this, sometimes I don't know, because as you've already mentioned, it's extremely challenging, um, but it's also extremely fulfilling. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is one particular project that we've been running, or I've been leading, in Lancaster now for the last two years. Um, it's a project called Catalyst, and essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand what role, if any, digital technologies play in promoting social change. So it's computing with a conscience would be another way of describing this. Um, and by digital technologies here, I principally mean things like mobile computing, social networking, data mining, visualization, um, augmented reality, these kinds of things. So that's the kind of scope of what we mean by digital technologies. And by social change, I mean a social agenda, so a particular um, social issue that, that presents very hard challenges that, that you need to bring people from multiple disciplines together to solve, and that potentially technology could, be, could help to solve, um, but also understanding that sometimes technology is not the solution, and definitely not taking a technology-led approach to this whole thing. So what is Catalyst? It's a research project. It started a little under two years ago. It's, it's a three-year research project. Um, it's funded by EPSRC, which is our equivalent in the UK of the NSF. Um, and we were very lucky to get quite a substantial amount of money uh, to fund this project, uh, about £1.9 million. Pounds. Um, and it's a project with a difference, really, because uh, we managed to get this funding without saying what we were actually going to do. And for any of you that's ever written a research proposal, you know that that's a magician's trick. Um, and the way that we managed to do this was that we said, well, we're going to take an issue that's just really extremely important, and that issue is um, digital technology for social change. But the, the nature of this beast is that social things change very quickly and technology changes so quickly. So if we were to write exactly this is what we're going to do for a three-year project, then things would have moved on. So instead, we designed a framework. So Catalyst is actually a, it's a, it's structured as a framework of projects. Um, so it's got multiple projects within it, and those projects are defined as the project moves forward. And it, it's based on a number of kind of key principles, if you like. And the first of those is that because we're looking at social problems, it would be 
kind of naive of us to kind of sit in our ivory tower and work on these social problems without actually engaging with the community. So at, at, a, at a very core, what we do is we set up partnerships between academics within the university and people outside the university in various communities. Now here I'm talking about charities, local government associations, NGOs, social enterprises, community organizations, and individuals. And to date, within that two-year period, we've, we've, we've worked in some way with about 70 different uh, community groups or community associations. So this was, this was going from zero to 70 in less than two years, um, which sounds slow for a car, um, but for a research project is pretty fast. Okay? Um, the other thing that we do is we take a fundamentally multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, whatever you want to call it, approach to this. Um, you know, because um, if you're going to address real social issues, um, you need lots of disciplines to be involved. We're trying to address the so-called wicked problems that really need multiple perspectives. So we actually started uh, with about five different academic departments at Lancaster, uh, computing, sociology, arts and design, environmental science and management. Um, but we decided after a while that five disciplines wasn't challenging enough for us, and so we added three more, um, including psychology and the School of Health and Medicine. You'll see the theme of this talk is that we, we do things in a very kind of mad and crazy way. And as I said, it's really a framework of projects. So what we do is we set up partnerships between academics and community members, and they decide the problems that they want to work on. And the criteria for those problems is it must be developing a new digital technology that addresses some kind of social problem. Um, and so a lot of our work is really, you know, networking with these different people and bringing them together. They, they, they then kind of come to us and say, well, we've got an idea for this project. Um, but the key thing to understand is that um, these are kind of co-design projects, all of them. So the, the, the non-academics, the community partners, um, have an equal say in what, get, what the problem is. They have an equal say in developing the technical solution. They have an equal say in testing it, evaluating it, and an equal say in making sure that it has a lifetime beyond the project. And because different projects are different, we actually have two different types of projects. Um, the big projects uh, we call sprints, hence the title of this talk. Um, and these are typically six to nine month projects. So they're, very, you know, they're not multiple year things. They're, they're, they're strictly time limited to six to nine months. And they get a lot of resource from the Catalyst project to do their work. And then we also have much smaller things which we call launch pads, which are for more kind of speculative ideas. And that's just a small pot of money that we give to the team and they go and do something with and hopefully it, it leads to great things. Um, and we have these different mechanisms for different purposes. You know, Transcending all of this is the fact that, you know, this is a research project. It's not a public engagement project. It's not just about going out to the community and, and, and kind of communicating science to the public. Um, we're trying to um, be innovative and have world-quality publishable research in what we do. And so we have kind of four broad research questions that these projects have to fit into. And the first of these is... What is the role of digital technologies in supporting communities to innovate, you know, supporting bottom-up innovation? So the project actually started at around the time that the Arab Spring was happening. And back then, there was a lot of kind of debate about the role of social media um, in the Arab Spring. And some people said it was a game changer, bringing together communities in a much easier way. Some people said, no, that's not right. You know, it's, it's just another form of communication. And there didn't seem to be any consensus in, you know, how can digital technologies support communities to change the world? So that was our kind of starting point, our fundamental research question. But we wanted to do more than just understand existing technologies. We wanted to invent new technologies. And really the reason for this was, you know, if you take something like Twitter, you know, it's been appropriated very effectively in certain situations for a, for a social cause. Um, various social enterprises and stuff have, have taken Twitter and done great things with it. But it wasn't designed specifically with a social agenda in mind. And so it's a natural question to ask, if you were to define the next generation of social media or the next generation of digital technologies that had a social agenda built in, what would they look like? So that was, again, another of our overarching research questions. These are quite large, ambitious research questions, as you can tell. Um, 
And the other thing is that one, one of the things that you find when you do this kind of work, when you're working with communities, is often what happens is you go and you work with the community and you, you do some good work with them, but then, uh, you know, the, the, the funding dries out and the academics go away and, and that's the end of the story. And those lessons that you've learned don't get transformed to other communities. So from the very beginning, we had an agenda of sustainability. We didn't want to parachute in and then parachute out again. And we wanted to make sure that anything that we learned, anything we came up with, would scale and go across different communities. And then finally, one of the things I'll talk about a little bit today is that we're bringing all these different disciplines together, and sometimes they work well together, and sometimes they fight. And, you know, we felt that there wasn't, you know, one place where you could go to and really read about, you know, how to make multidisciplinary research work. So we have built into the project a way of documenting the process of multidisciplinary research itself um, so that we can learn lessons. Okay, uh, before I go any further, for, I mean, how many people here have heard of Lancaster? Uh, and, and I'm talking about Lan not Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Lancaster, England. Um, for those that haven't heard of it, it's in the northwest of England. It's about an hour northwest of Manchester. Um, some fun facts about Lancaster. Um, there was famous witch trials in Lancaster in the 1600s, very similar to the Salem witch trials that you guys have. And in fact, my surname, Whittle, is the same as the surname of the chief witch. Um, she was called Anne Whittle, and she's buried in Lancaster Castle. And um, I could allege that I'm actually descended from witches, so be careful asking those nasty questions at the end. Um, another fun fact is that Gollum, um, from the Lord of the Rings movies, he actually went to Lancaster University, believe it or not. Um, the Andy Serkis, who's the actor who played Gollum, actually went to school at Lancaster University. And another fun fact is that Lancaster is actually the coldest place on Earth, um, really, because we have a, our physics department is ranked number one in the country, and they do low temperature physics there, and they've actually managed to achieve the lowest temperature um, in, in, that anybody's ever achieved. So, it's, so, so those are some fun facts about Lancaster. Okay, so I said that there's two types of projects, and I'll describe some of the actual projects that we've done shortly. Um, but I just want to tell you how the structure of Catalyst works as a whole. So we have these sprints and we have these launch pads. And the sprints are quite um, different to kind of typical research projects that you might see. So once this community and this multidisciplinary academic team come together, they've decided that they've got a particular problem that they want to solve. What do they get? Well, we give them the resources of the Catalyst project for that six to nine month period. And those resources consist of, yes, there's some money for travel and equipment and so forth, but principally they get five full-time postdoctoral research staff to work with them on their problem for the duration of that six to nine month period. And these five full-time research staff are multidisciplinary themselves. They come from different backgrounds. Many of them have come from multiple different backgrounds. And so, they, you know, it's, it's, although it's short, although it's only six to nine months, there's quite a big investment that goes into these sprints. Um, and we also have this, this, this tool called Prote, which I'll talk about later, which is our way of reflecting on this multidisciplinary way of working. And Prote is actually a tool that was developed at Lancaster University um, with some European partners, including Bruno Latour. Um, and it was developed um, for, you know, for documenting radical innovation projects. So it's very appropriate to what we're trying to do. And each of these sprints, once they're formed, they really have to do two things. They have to do good social science. They have to go in and they have to really understand the problem that a particular community has. Uh, we don't want these to be kind of shallow technology-led projects. But they also have to develop um, a, a new technical solution of some description. Um, and they don't just have to do that in the lab, but they have to develop that and deploy it in the wild, that is, with real people, with real users, um, you know, and, and a, a robust prototype, not a, the final thing, but a, but a prototype. So they have to, you know, so they, they have, there has to be a community partner, there has to be academics, there's five multidisciplinary researchers. Um, they have to get to grips um, with a challenging social issue, develop a technology demonstrator and deploy it in the wild, all in the space of six to nine months. Sounds easy, doesn't it? You know, it sounds very it's easy, trivial, you know, no, no problem, we can do this. Okay, so to give you an idea of the kind of projects we've done so far, and in, in two years, as I said, we've worked with about 70 different community groups, about eight different academic disciplines. Um, there's 15 co-investigators involved in this project from those dis different disciplines, and we've done about eight different projects um, altogether. 
The first of the projects that we did um, was a project called Patchworks. And just to give you an idea of how these projects form, we ran what we call an ideas lab, which is kind of a creative thinking session. And we brought people from different backgrounds together. And this team formed, Patchworks team, um, that then went on to do this particular project. Um, and in this team were kind of three groups of people. Um, there was um, homeless people. So there was a charity called Signposts who work with the homeless. Um, there was a group called Mad Lab, which is a kind of non-profit um, DIY um, hacking community that's based in Manchester. Um, and they, the, the kind of thing they do is that they, um, they, they, they kind of produce low-cost open source versions of kind of commercial technologies. So they built a DNA sequencer, for example, for a couple of hundred pounds, whereas commercial uh, versions will cost you thousands of pounds. So they, they just beg, borrow, and steal bits, and they put it together in a very kind of disorganized, well, unorganized way. And on top of that, there were academics from environmental science and health and medicine. So you, you had this triangle of very interesting team, and it turned out that they were all in some way living a kind of chaotic life. So if you talk to the homeless people, um, and there's different ranges of what homeless means, but they don't necessarily know where they're going to sleep the next night. Um, they need to get information about job possibilities or appointments with doctors, and they never know where that's coming from. Principally, they don't have much of access to the internet, so they're, they're definitely suffering from the digital divide. So they live these chaotic lives. But this Mad Lab community also lives its own kind of version of a chaotic life because it's a non-for-profit run in a very kind of grassroots driven way. No one's getting paid and, and people just decide to run a workshop on a topic and, and they kind of do it. And so it's kind of chaotic, but in a different sense. And then, of course, you've got the academics as the third point in that triangle who have their own form of chaos. Some would say the most chaotic. So you had these three groups of people, and what they did, they basically spent some time looking at, you know, what are the technology needs of homeless people? What could we do to, to address a very specific problem that homeless people have that potentially could have a digital technology solution? And rather than um, me drone on and tell you exactly what they came up with, um, I have a little video here that will explain everything. Computer, very low cost. 
and uh, very powerful and it allows you to do lots of different things. Um, and so connected to that is a little thermal receipt printer and an RFID um, reader as well. So it can read the RFID tags that people carry around them. And it talks to the it talks to the internet, it talks to an email server to, to grab down the latest messages and then uh, spit them out on the printer. The most rewarding thing is when we brought one of our services back from Manchester and he is a regular service user one day. He said, there is such a big world out there and I'm wasting my life, I need to do something. And to me that, that summed up what we were about, it's about opening doors to people that wouldn't think of walking through them in normal circumstances. So that gives you an idea of what this team came up with. Um, I mean, just a couple of comments on that. Um, so at, at, you know, one of the things I like to point out there is that the, the people in that video were from all walks of life. There was academics in there, there were homeless people in there, there were people working from the charity, people working from this Mad Lab organization. And people can't always tell which is which. So this is a form of very bottom-up driven innovation, micro-innovation. Um, that is very democratic. Everybody on the team has an equal say in what happens. And although um, you, know, you could look at that and say, well, it's, you know, it's solving a very kind of small problem, um, the problem it's solving is a problem that was very real to these homeless people that were in our user group. Um, the other thing I like to point out about it is that, um, and I'll return to this theme later, is that you, know, you could look at this from a if you to look at this from a purely technological point of view, you might say, well, that's not very innovative, it's quite mundane. Um, and that's true, although there are innovative parts to it. For example, this, um, this, this whole kit costs a um, very small amount of money. They were using a Raspberry Pi computer, if people know Raspberry Pi, which is a very kind of cheap um, computer that was originally designed to get children into programming, um, but we've appropriated it here for this social purpose. Uh, if you were to build this kind of thing commercially, you'd end up spending a lot of money on it. Um, and the other thing I like to point, to point out is the sustainability of the project. So what actually happened here is that within that eight-month period, I think it was, the team developed PAT, the, the, the box there, um, and it's, it's a, a simple uh, way of allowing homeless people to access very specific information instead, you know, uh, using this pat box. And the idea was that these would be placed at different parts in the town so that, you know, they don't have internet access, so they, but they could get the information they needed from these little boxes um, in a very easy way. And as a, at the end of the project, a consortium got together, not instigated by us, but consisting of kind of local charities, local organizations. And they liked the idea so much that they didn't want to just see it die. Um, and they actually saw potential for it to be used, not just with the homeless, but with all kinds of people that they provide services to. They, were then, they then went off and tried to get money to continue the development of this thing, and they were successful in getting 350,000 pounds of further investment and I'm now talking about trying to roll this out over the whole of northwest of England as a kind of front end uh, to their casework database. So at some level, it's a very simple thing, um, but it's a very innovative process. It's a very bottom up, um, and it's been done in a very kind of sustainable way. Um, to give you another, another example, which is a little bit more technologically innovative, um, that was the first sprint that we did. And now remember that um, I said there were these five um, postdoctoral researchers that work on Catalyst. And what happens is when one sprint finishes at the end of that six to nine months, those five full-time researchers then move on to the next sprint, which might be on a completely different topic. And in fact, it was on a completely different topic in this case because it revolved around uh, autism. And there was a team that formed of local government, uh, the National Autistic Society, and um, a group of high-functioning adults on the autistic spectrum who, who got together and did a similar thing, bottom-up innovation, co-design, um, identify a specific problem that we have as people on the autistic spectrum that technology might provide help with. And what they came up with um, was a kind of, um, it, it's, it relates to the area of quantified self or life logging, if people know that area. Um, one of the big issues, it turns out, that, that adults with autism have is anxiety. Um, they find it difficult to kind of go out and be part of society because they get very anxious in uncertain situations. And they often have what they call stimming devices, which might be a ball that they squeeze or a bracelet that they pull, which is just a little thing that they tend to have that kind of reduces their anxiety levels. 
So essentially what this team did, they made, it, they made that digital. And why did they make it digital? Because um, you can then get a kind of history of your anxiety levels over time. Um, and in fact, that's what this, this, this tool provides you. So they can get a kind of digital map of when they were feeling anxious, what made them feel anxious, and then they can look back at that over time and reflect and say, oh, well, I, I seem to get really anxious when this particular thing was happening. It's also linked to a peer support network, an online social network um, that's a closed social network. It only consisted of their, of their carers and their support workers and their friends so that they could actually use it to get, um, you know, um, uh, support in emergency situations and things like that. But I think the real value of it is this kind of um, web-based um, anxiety kind of timeline that they have. And, I'll, and I've got another little video that will kind of explain this in more detail. Do you experience lots of anxiety? Yes. It's more of a symptom rather than a problem. The problem is, is, is chaos and change and stuff, which causes anxiety. The cause is people not being consistent, the world not being consistent. And you could be out and a bus doesn't turn up and it, it, you're going to get anxious. So, other than the toilets, let us know that we can doing that and help us get out of the house a bit more as well. Access is the it's a nine month scattered sprint. Um, it works with uh, people on an autistic spectrum disorder and is a partnership between uh, Lancaster University Academics together with uh, Lancashire County Council, the National Autistic Society, the NHS. Um, the key aim of the project is to develop um, technologies that may address anxiety management needs of adults on the high end of the spectrum. The core user group consists of 10 members. There are five people that are on the spectrum and then there are four people that are professional care support people on the spectrum as well as family members. The process consists really in three key phases. The first phase is when we upskill share knowledge and build trust among the partners including academics. The second phase is when the idea emerges and the first prototypes are produced. And the third phase, which is the one that we are in now, is the Agile Utility Prototype Development, where we, every two weeks, we develop a new version of the prototype with the help of the core user group. The prototype at the moment is um, taking a person's anxiety coping device that so might be some people like the passing through their hands. Or they might squeeze like a stress ball type thing, or um, like pull on something, let's say, you know, something to fiddle with in their hands. Basically, any symptom like the one which is active rather than passive and will help uh, as a communication tool with our support network. This is the, the, the global game controller, which we're using as um, a tactile and um, digital stress ball. And as I squeeze it, um, the trace the information is related to the computer. And so as I squeeze, you know, squeeze hard, an alert is generated, which then triggers an SMS to the person's support network. One of our key objectives in the development of the system is to embed values in the, the system features, uh, which means to be uh, understanding exactly what are the key user requirements, not just from a technical perspective, but from their value perspective. I'll give you a very practical example. Uh, we ended up choosing like Diaspora as a social network platform uh, because the core user group wanted something that they could trust and uh, where the privacy was protected and respected. We use existing um, technologies and, and social networking platforms because it allows us to quickly build something and it allows us to then use that to quickly get feedback on the direction that the system design is going and allows us to iterate on that and build on and refine those ideas rather than um, build something from scratch which can take a long time and not be a good fit. One of the biggest lessons learned of working with extreme users of our lives is the fact that the researchers have to really push their comfort zones, challenge their biases and just playing with methods. 
Um, so it's really is creating a, a completely different roles as well in research that we are not just like scholars of innovation, uh, but we become practitioners of social innovation. The main thing for me is it's something I can see that could benefit myself, but it's also something that can benefit others. I've always wanted to get involved in doing something that's helped others and also to do it in a way where it was something close to my heart, and obviously autism is close to my heart. So you can see again in this project some of the kind of key ingredients of the kind of things we do. Um, that were there, uh, there was a lot of mention of kind of rapid prototyping. Uh, you'll see later when I talk about the methods that we use that we borrow a lot from kind of agile development methodologies from software engineering. Uh, you know, uh, borrow a lot from kind of user-centered design, borrow a lot from ethnography and social science and so forth, but combine it together in a way that you can do something in six to nine month period. Um, there's just one more video I want to show you, um, of, just to give you a flavor of the kind of projects we've done. This is a, quite a different project. Uh, this was a project where we actually worked with a group of athletes. Um, and many people here will know that um, you know, if, if, you, if you run, if you're an athlete, uh, nowadays you can buy uh, sensor kits that will allow you to kind of track vital statistics as you run. So you can wear your Nike fuel band or a, a chest sensor to measure your heart rate and you can get home and then you can upload your GPS and your heart rate as it moved um, onto Facebook or something like that. Um, but one of the projects we had was to actually work with athletes um, to try and understand this relationship afforded by these new kind of biometric sensor sharing applications um, and, and look at what the effect is on people's social ties. So the best example I can give to you of this is that suppose that you have a daughter who likes to run marathons um, but she lives in a different part of the world. As a, as a parent, you might you know, be a little bit worried when she goes to run marathons. Using our Heartlink system, you can now view in real time, remotely, this person running the marathon, and as well as a kind of GPS location of where they are, you can get um, data on their heart rate in real time um, and other biometric signals in real time. And the, 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 and the other thing you can do is you can actually send real-time motivation to the person running this marathon. So it's a two-way thing. So um, the person wears a sensor and they have an Android phone in their pocket um, which communicates with the sensor and communicates with the outside world. There's a little button in the, in the user interface for the viewers that's a bit like a Facebook like button, um, but it's called a cheer button. And if, if enough people press that cheer button, the Android phone vibrates. So you can be running the race and you can get real-time crowdsourced motivation from your friends and family that are remotely geographically located. So it's just like someone being there and applauding you, except they're all over the world and they're watching you. And it's all linked to Facebook so they can actually communicate and share. And the research we've done around that shows that um, that, uh, you know, we've done a lot of kind of qualitative research understanding how this actually changes the relationship between the viewers and participants of the races. And um, we've shown that it can actually strengthen the, 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 the links, the connectivity between, between these people. So um, you have to bear with me a little bit on the next interview, on the next um, video, because it's, uh, it's got a computer generated voice, which is not that easy to understand, but there are subtitles.
sessions with amateur athletes, conducting an online survey, and using idea generation tools like Scamper, brainstorming sessions, and decision matrix. The first prototype was tested in a pilot study that was conducted during the Fiatcon in Lundemir. This was followed by a user study conducted during a charity run in Lancaster, United Kingdom. All the participants and viewers in the study reported they felt closer to each other after viewing biometric data. Similar outcomes are found in existing literature. Using hard work showed that this approach could be a very good tool for outsourcing information in real time from online crowd. For more details, we invite you to have a look at the paper, Hard Open Broadcast for Live Biometric Data to Social Networks. So again, you see some of the kind of key ingredients. The, the, the thing I like to point out there is the research in the wild um, element of it, which means that you know, you're not developing technology in the lab and just testing it in the lab. Um, our very first prototype of that, which was done in a couple of months, was actually in a triathlon in Windermere. We actually had one, one of our athletes didn't, compete, didn't uh, complete the race because they got into the very, very cold water in the north of England and froze, I mean, literally and metaphorically, um, and had to be kind of rescued. Um, so those are some of the kind of real world challenges you deal with when you actually try and test technology prototypes in the wild, so to speak. Um, there's lots of, I mean, I'm just trying to give you a flavor of the different types of projects here. Um, I'll briefly mention some of the other ones that we've done. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about methods. Um, one of the ones that's been quite successful actually started as a small launch pad with just a small money, a uh, small amount of money was a project called Barter. And this was all about trying to encourage people to trade more locally and more ethically within the local community. Not just food, but clothing, services, equipment, all kinds of other things. It was a partnership between academics in computing and sociology and between a local trading association called ESTA, the Ethical and Small Traders Association, which is based in Lancaster. And they were basically trying to stop money going out of the local area and to bolster the local economy, but not doing it by creating a new local currency, which some people have. What we did is we created a smartphone app that would allow businesses to track and also customers to track their local trades and then provide information to them, visualizations as to the benefits that those local trades are actually bringing to the local economy. So it's a behavior change project, um, but focused on kind of local sustainability issues. Some of the other things we've done, there's a, there was a project called Eco Home, which was all about um, running skill, upskilling workshops to allow people to, to build their own energy monitoring devices that they could use in their home so that they could get bespoke information about how they were using their energy rather than just the information that com came from the gas and oil companies. Um, there was a project called Life Mirror that was all about um, strengthening a local community by allowing people to upload um, uh, two to five second films that they'd shot. So it was a social network where every day somebody would, people would vote on a theme and then people would send in short clips related to that theme that were crowdsourced and then uh, they'd put that together into a kind of an artistic work that was then uh, displayed in kind of local cinemas and so forth. Um, and then a more traditional project that we ran in the early days called Activist Tweets that was uh, using our, our, our linguistics researchers to analyze the kinds of language that social activists use online and social media and as a way to understand how they could kind of maximize the influence of their messages uh, and so forth. So what you see with all of this is that at some level you look at these projects and they all seem very, very different. Um, but they've all got a number of things in common and that is that they're all democratic, working with the community. They're all driven bottom up. They're all kind of, you know, community led social innovation projects. They're all done in a very multidisciplinary way because you need those disciplines to understand the problem and to develop a solution. They're all done in a very short time frame as well. And that's one of the key things that people usually are kind of surprised at, you know, the, 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 the short time frame that we, that we do the, all these things in. And they all in some way answer one of those four fundamental research questions that we started with. We don't, of course, have the complete answer to those four research questions, but we have little snippets and little islands um, that we've done through this kind of experimentation process. So I want to talk a little bit, just for a few minutes, about what kind of methods and approaches we use in all of this. And, and, and there's various methods that we use, both across the Catalyst project as a whole and how we set these projects up, 
both within the projects themselves, um, in terms of making sure that they're sustainable over the long term and we don't parachute in and parachute out, and in terms of this protein method, um, which is to understand the multidisciplinary process itself. Um, across Catalyst, you know, it's, it's the teams that form that do the real research work. So our job across Catalyst is to bring these teams together. Um, and so we, we run lots of kind of networking events. We run events called Ideas Lab, which are kind of, um, you know, we use a lot of kind of creativity techniques and we bring people together and we get them to form into teams and, and, and come up with um, issues that they want to solve. We run things called serendipity cafes, which are usually run by people in the community, not the academics. And that's when somebody in the local community has a particular issue they're interested in uh, and they have these cafes and we invite a whole bunch of people and we hope that serendipity happens. We have pop-up events um, where we run kind of information sessions that literally just pop up on campus at random times and we just try and, you know, keep it, keep it real, keep it live, keep it dynamic. Um, don't give a schedule because then they'll, they'll get bored, um, do it randomly. Um, we spend a lot of time on this kind of stuff, you know. In the two years that we've been going, I would say the first three months was really focused on these kind of networking activities to bring people together and the right people together. So as I said, we went from, you know, zero community groups that we were working with to 70 community groups that we've been working with during that time. When it comes to the projects themselves within the sprints, we're of course trying to be multidisciplinary and you immediately have a problem then. Even if you're within your own discipline, there are lots and lots of different methods or methodologies that you could apply and it's quite difficult to choose the right one. Once you start looking at multiple disciplines, each discipline has its own set of methods that you could apply. And so how do you navigate through this space of you know, hundreds of different me methods that you could apply? So we spent quite a lot of time, I guess, looking at, you know, methods from HCI, methods from social science, methods from kind of software development. And without going into this in too much detail, we didn't quite find a method that worked for us. Um, so, of course, we had to invent our own. Um, and we call that method speed play. Um, but it's, it's not rocket science. I mean, basically what we do is we take agile development methods from computer science and we take um, things like ethnography and action research from social science. Now agile development is really good at building things quickly, you know, it involves lots of kind of rapid prototyping, you typically build uh, prototypes and iterations of a week to two weeks, you get your customer feedback on that, you iterate, you adapt. Um, so it's, it's very good at, you know, building something that matches a customer's needs very quickly. However, the problem with it is that it's been used almost exclusively in a kind of corporate environment where you've got these customers that are paying for a service. It's not been used in this kind of community environment. And the difference in the community environment is it's not that you've got a customer who's God who's paying, you've got a team that has equal say. And really what you need to do, as any of you will have worked with the community know, is that you have to spend a lot of time building trust and building the relationship. Um, and so that, that's not something that's normally part of agile development. You know, they just, they have a set of requirements from their customer when they start building things. For us, there was no set of requirements from the customer. We had to go in, we had to train the community in what we do technologically, um, but they also had to train us in what they do, you know, providing services to the homeless, providing services to people with autism and so forth. So you need time to really understand the core problem in depth properly uh, to speak to the people and to, and to build trust and to make, sh make sure that you're on the same page in terms of your values. So typically in a nine month project, we would, we would have about three months where we do that kind of thing at the beginning, but then that continues throughout. It doesn't just stop. So, and, and so, so agile development methods, good at building things very fast, not so good at this kind of trust relationship part. Then you go to the more kind of social science-y stuff, and of course what they're good at is building this kind of trust and relationship part, you know. Things like ethnography, really good at going in, observing, understanding a problem in depth. Where it's not so good is doing things fast, you know. Ethnographies can take years before the ethnographer is kind of happy with what they've got. Um, it's a very kind of long, laborious process. A very rich process, but very long and laborious. So essentially what Speedplay does at its most basic level is it takes the best bits from agile development and it takes the best bits from kind of social science methodologies and it puts them together in a way that we can actually do something that solves a real problem develops a real solution in a very short space of time. Now, I won't claim that that's without its problems. It certainly is. 
and I'll talk about some of these shortly, but that's basically what we've come up with. And it wasn't come up with by sitting in a lab and being theoretical, it was come up with by trying lots of different things out and seeing what worked, and this kind of evolved over time. Sustainability is at its core with everything that we do. I've already mentioned this. Um, how do we maintain sustainability? So how, what about these technology prototypes that we develop, these partnerships that form? How do, we main, how do we ensure that they don't just stop once the catalyst funding runs out? Well, there's no magic. We don't have any magic formula or methodology to give you for that. But what we, will do, what we can say is that from the very first day, we start to put plans in place so that the project has a, li has a, has a lifetime beyond the initial funding. Um, and and this, 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 is, this means that the research work goes on, but at the same time, you're constantly thinking about, you know, where is this going? What's the, what's the exit strategy? Um, and so you start to identify, for instance, people in the team who are going to be the champions that are going to take it forward. Um, and it's really, you know, it's, again, no magic to this, but you just have to kind of have this in your awareness in your mind and not think of it two weeks before the end of the project, basically. It seems to have been quite successful. As I said, this Patchworks project was successful in getting £350,000 to take their project forward. The Barter project, which was the local trade, local ethical trading project, was successful in getting £250,000 of further research funding. And they're now taking that forward into a commercial proposition with the original partner, the original trading um, authority. Um, and there are other things that, that have done, but that really is, a, is of key importance to us. And then there's this thing called Prote that people are often curious about. Um, and as I said, this, this, this was a, a method, a management tool, really, that was developed for what was called radically innovative projects. And how do you, um, how do you manage such projects? And it really, has, it really has two principles. The first thing it tries to do is to make sure that you learn as much from your failures as you do your successes. Typically, in research projects, as well as in other kinds of projects, um, you don't tell anybody about your failures, right? You know, you don't go back to your funding agency and say, hey, we tried all this stuff and it didn't work. Give us more money. It's probably not a good strategy. Um, you go back and you say, hey, we tried this stuff and it's wonderful and we here's some data and it all, it all works. Prote flips that on its head and it said that usually we learn more from failing than we do from success. And so it has a method that explicitly documents the failures, okay? And allows people to be open in expressing those failures. Um, the other thing it does, the other principle behind it, is to make sure that you've done due diligence when decisions are make, made. So often what can happen, especially in these kind of co-design projects, is that um, decisions are made depending on who shouts the loudest or who happens to be in the room at the time. But it's not necessarily the, the best decision. It might be, but it's not necessarily the best. And so Prote acts as a bit of a kind of devil's advocate that will probe you and it will make sure that you've really thought about it and there's not alternatives that you should be considering. How does it work in practice? Well, it's actually very simple. Um, the best way I can describe it is it's like going to a counselor. If, any, if anybody here has ever been to a counselor, I certainly have, you go there and you get an opportunity to talk about your life for an hour and somebody listens. It's the most marvelous thing in the world. Um, and then they kind of, they listen to you and they make kind of constructive suggestions and they, they get you to think about things in a different way. And in many ways, that's what Prote does. There are things called Prote dialogues, which happen usually about once a month. And you go and there's a Prote team, um, and it's even been described in academic publications as socio-technical therapy, um, so I'm not so far off the mark. And you go there and they ask you questions based on a set of things that they're looking for to make sure that you're learning from your failure, that you have done due diligence. At the end of that, the Prote team then goes away and writes a report um, with some recommendations or some things to think about. And, and it's actually been an invaluable asset, I think, to the project, both in terms of documenting how we work across disciplines and where we succeed and where we fail, um, but also just documenting the project as a whole, which makes it easier to kind of write up publications later. So it's a, it's a really good um, tool. You do, you, you, it's not really that complicated. It can get complicated, but you can use it in a very simple way. Okay, so I want to spend the, the last kind of 10 to 15 minutes in the talk um, talking about some of our failures, because I said we often learn as much as up from our failures as our successes. Um, before I look, talk about the failures, let's talk about the successes. Let's, 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 let's get on a good page. We've had lots of successes. Um, we've, I think we have set out to do what we intended to do. These projects have delivered a real community contribution, but in addition to that, they've also delivered 
world-leading publishable research. So um, the HeartLink project, for example, was published at CHI last year. Anybody would be proud of a CHI paper. Um, I think often what you see when people go out into the community um, you know, and they do public engagement projects is that you know, they're doing good work, but it's not necessarily publishable work. What we've achieved here is that we've done that, but in a way that's being innovative enough that your peers can actually review it and it's actually publishable. I think the other thing that we've done um, is that we have really changed attitudes towards the university. Although Lancaster University doesn't have a bad relationship by any means with its local environment, it's still the case, as with many universities, that you know, it's seen as a bit of an ivory tower and these experts are in there and they're kind of inaccessible. Um, I think we've really broken down a lot of barriers through this process uh, and people, uh, you know, partnerships have formed between the new university and outside that would, you know, came about from Catalyst but weren't necessarily explicitly supported from Catalyst. We've also achieved this kind of sustainability agenda, I think, these technology prototypes um, are going forward and, and just putting people together, new partnerships, not a bad thing. And I think in terms of the research, we've, it's certainly true that the disciplines have learned a lot from each other. But one thing I'm quite proud of is the fact that the publications that we've made are in different disciplinary venues. So it's not the case that, you know, one discipline is acting as a service provider to the other, which often happens when you merge computing and social science, for example. You end up with a lot of computing publications with a bit of ethnography at the end. You know, that's not what it is. It's an equal relationship. Um, and we've, you know, we've published in management journals, we've published in computing uh, conferences and in sociology venues and so forth. But of course, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's not all wonderful. Um, you know, we faced a lot, a lot of challenges along the way. And, and just to give you a flavor of kind of some of the lessons with, that we've learned that I think can be taken for anybody else who's trying to do similar kind of stuff. Um, you know, working in the community is really hard, you know. Um, when we started this project, somebody said to me, you know, as soon as you put your head above the parapet, someone's going to be there to shoot it off. And that's definitely true. Um, what you tend to find is that, you know, people in academia and people in the outside world have different values. They have different things that they need to, to do. Um, you know, academics need to get high quality publications and to get promoted. Uh, people working in community organizations need to get funds from somewhere to continue their work or they need to get very immediate benefits um, that they can show they're providing a service to their users. Perhaps most interesting part of this is that it's not, it's not a binary relationship. It's not just a case of the academics have one set of values, the non-academics have another. There's a whole bunch of people out in the community, for example, that have different venues. And you'll see this most starkly if you compare, say, a small charity with a local government organization. And local government organizations often have quite different needs from the people that they're servicing. Um, they need, you know, um, we've, we've had conflicts where, you know, the local government has, has wanted to do things in a certain way so that they can justify their existence within the, 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 the greater government. Um, but it's not necessarily what the people on the ground that they're supposed to be servicing actually wants. So you have all these different values that people have and all these different needs. And I've seen this most starkly, perhaps, with um, kind of early career researchers, these five postdoctoral research assistants, you know, who are trying to build an academic career after all. And if they really want an academic career and they want to do it in the most efficient way, what they really should do is lock themselves in their room and just pick one very, very narrow thing and write lots of papers about it. But of course, that's not the kind of project that this is. So they are often pulled in all kinds of different directions. With, you know, they get involved with these real people with real problems, which is very emotional, and they really want to try and help. Um, but they've got this university cracking the whip at the back, saying, you know, write, 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 publish, or perish. Um, managerial issues so you know I paint this picture of this utopian democratic society with these projects you know we bring these teams together communities and academics and they're all equal and everybody has a an equal say in the in the decisions that get, that get taken place and of course sometimes it works like that but most of the time it doesn't work like that what the, the, the sticking point tends to be uh, when they when people when the team has decided on a problem that they want to address they then generate lots of ideas but you can't, of course, develop all of those ideas. You have to pick one or pick two. And that's the point when somebody has to make a decision. You know, which of these hundreds of ideas that we've generated are we actually going to implement and test? And of course, that's where you can lose the engagement of people, because if, it, if you don't pick the one that they wanted, 
Um, and I think the key point here is that um, I think there's a di kind of distinct lack of management expertise who can kind of manage that process in a way that everybody's happy. If you think about it, you know, management is difficult. Managing academics is really difficult. Managing academics when they come from different disciplines and think differently is extremely difficult. Managing multiple academics from different disciplines with community partners involved is almost impossible, you know. Um, and we've, we've done it different ways where someone from the community manages the project, an academic manages the project and so forth. Uh, it's just really hard and I think if we're really going to do this kind of thing in the future we need more training and, and methods for how to do that. Um, then there's the thing about well-being. So we talked about sustainability of the prototypes of the projects, but there's also the sustainability of the researchers themselves. There are a roaming group of these five researchers who move from project to project, each one challenging from a social perspective, each one very emotional. They really invest their time and they really invest themselves. And they can burn out if they're not careful. So you have to be really careful, I think, when you're working in the community not to burn out. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about ethics. Uh, we, of course, follow all ethical protocols, um, but ethics are typically set up in universities kind of to protect, protect the subjects or to protect the university from litigation, but ostensibly to, to protect the subjects. They don't, there's not a lot of talk about protecting the researchers themselves, and that's an area that I think could do with a bit more work. Um, innovation. Are these projects innovative? I've already kind of hinted um, that they might not always be um, in one sense. Um, and this is, we've discovered this and other people who've done similar things have discovered this as well. That when you do these kind of projects, uh, you get a conflict between whether the innovations that you come up with are, are truly revolutionary, truly innovative, or actually quite mundane. Um, the best example of this is the Patchworks project where they developed the kind of thermal printer pat box. Um, there were actually two competing designs that came out of the first stage of that project, one of which was really revolutionary and would have been great to publish in all kinds of academic venues as something crazy. And the other one that was quite mundane but solved it a real actual current problem. Uh, and the team chose the mundane one um, and, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, I could have gone in as the academic and said, no, we're about revolutionary research, let's do the other one. But then, of course, they would have disengaged with that whole process. So it's quite difficult to manage um, you know, doing something that provides immediate benefit but yet is innovative at the same time that you can actually publish. Um, uh, and uh, that's certainly a difficulty. Um, and then there's just the process of coming up with the ideas in the first place. I mean, this is an old truism that ideas are cheap, but they really are. Um, you know, uh, the, the, and one of the interesting things, I said this about methods earlier, there's lots of methods out there for running creativity sessions, for generating ideas. Um, and at one point, we started getting inundated with requests from people. So, you know, someone would come to us and say, hey, we've just developed this new creativity exercise. We think we've heard about your Catalyst project. We think it would be great for you. And the first few requests, I thought, oh, that sounds great. That's exactly what I need. And then after the kind of the 10th or the 20th or the 50th request for this, I realized that there's just there's too much stuff out there. And navigating your way through the kind of ideas generation processes and methods that people come up with. Um, is really difficult and you have to say no and just do what works for you and do something that's simple for you. Um, working across disciplines, uh, you all do this a lot I think in the iSchool, um, so you'll probably recognize a lot of the stuff that I'm about to say. Um, usually when I say to people, oh I do a lot of multidisciplinary research, the response is, oh that must be really difficult because you use the same words to mean different things, so you must spend time having to write a dictionary so you can understand each other. Well, yes, terminology is a problem, but it's an easy problem to solve. You know, working across disciplines is much, much deeper than simply terminological problems. Um, people from different disciplines have fundamentally different approaches to how they approach research, how they approach problem solving. And those, um, and not, it's not that one is right and one is wrong, but those approaches have been instilled in them from a very early age. They have been trained in that way and you can't just change that within a six to nine month catalyst sprint. So you have to work really hard to get people from one discipline to understand the approaches from another discipline, not whether it's better or worse, but just that different people do things differently and that, you know, both things can work. And, and this, this, this manifests itself very much in terms of time scales. So, 
you know, if you, if you talk to many computer scientists, for example, they like to do things very quickly. You know, technology moves very fast, right? So if you're a computer scientist, you have to move fast too. Um, where, you know, if you're doing uh, maybe more social science-oriented things, ethnography and so forth, th they like to take their time over things. I'm obviously generalizing wildly here. Um, but there's, there's different timescales that are involved in each different discipline. And trying to bring those together and marry them in a way that, you know, you're going fast enough but not too fast is really, really challenging. And I think we've kind of managed to do that with the speed play thing, but it, again, it, it has caused issues. I won't lie to you. Um, what I call the selfish academic. So, um, you know, uh, ac academics uh, are great people. Um, I'm one. Um, but they have a research agenda, and they like to follow that research agenda. And it's not a failing. Um, it's just that, you know, they, they have a, a problem they're trying to look at, and they, they, they've made an incremental advance, and so they want to move that forward a little bit. But that's not the kind of project we do in Catalyst, where you've got this kind of democratic bottom-up innovation. It may be that the stuff that comes out isn't closely aligned to that academic's research agenda th that went into it in the first place. And so they, they might disengage from the process. Um, we, we, we thought we'd solved this problem, actually, because we when we um, got the bid for the funding, we actually wrote in um, uh, resources so we could buy out academics from teaching duties and from admin duties. And our thinking was, oh, you know, the reason academics don't get involved in multidisciplinary projects is because they don't have time. So if we buy them out of teaching, they'll get involved. It doesn't work. Um, and the reason it doesn't work is because the reasons academics get involved in something is because if it's, is it closely aligned with their research agenda or not? And it's irrespective of whether you buy them out or not. Um, and then there's the, the, just the way that universities are set up. Now, Lancaster's pretty good for this. It's got a history of interdisciplinary research. Um, it's actually relatively easy to work with someone from a different department compared to some places I've been. I'm sure Berkeley is like this as well. Uh, but still, the very, very way that universities are set up is to have departments compete with each other. They compete with each other for internal resources. And so if you're doing a truly... Um, you know, interdisciplinary project like this, unless you've got something like the iSchool where you're already interdisciplinary, um, you know, you have, to, you have to fight against those processes that are put in place uh, at some level to stop you working with people from that other discipline. And again, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Um, and then there's a whole bun bunch of kind of logistical stuff that I'll just briefly mention. Um, you know, uh, uh, just the way that universities or some universities deal with, with contracts, for example. I mean, our university is largely set up, you know, it thinks of contracts in terms of contracting with big business, and therefore it's all about trying to protect the IP um, from that big business. Uh, they're not so used to doing projects with community organizations where you might have shared IP and you might actually give up the IP to allow them to take things forward. Um, they were even not used to kind of financially remunerating the community. We, you know, we, we, have, we, give, we pay the community members to be involved in these projects. Why shouldn't they be paid? The researchers are paid. Why shouldn't they be paid? They can't afford to be involved otherwise. And just, you know, a lot of work we had to do um, in setting up the procedures to do that. Um, and sometimes the, the funding body rules themselves are not supportive of this kind of thing. We even had a case on a different project where... Um, there was, a, there was a call that was specifically designed for universities to partner with external institutions, but the call said that we, work, we, we can't give money to the external institutions. And again, it's because they were thinking of, you know, you're partnering with a business and we don't want to fund businesses. But it doesn't work if you're partnering with community groups that don't have any money, right? Um, so that, that actually caused a lot of problems. Um, so there's a whole kind of bunch of stuff um, that, that we've learned, stuff that we would have done differently um, had we had the chance to do things again. Um, and I'm sure you will, you know, if you've ever done this kind of work, you'll recognize these kinds of things. Um, we do plan to kind of write these kind of lessons learned down in some form, because often what people say to us is, that, yeah, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, but no one's really written that down yet. So I think there's an opportunity to do that. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll actually finish there. I believe we've got about 20 minutes or 15, 20 minutes left. I think it's good to have, you know, plenty of time for questions. Um, I don't, I'm also, I'm in the Bay Area until the seven, the September 11th, so if anybody is interested in um, talking to me more about this, feel free to contact me at the email at the top. If you just want to find more information about the project in general, that's our website, that's our Twitter ID. Um, we try to be quite active there, um, and I'll, and I'll ent happily entertain any questions that you all might have.
a great subject. Uh, so it's uh, any of your project was actually approached toward uh, fixing some of the chronic diseases, uh, such diabetics and stuff like that, through this multidisciplinary approach and uh, uh, behavior modifications, for example. Um. No, not specifically. I mean, I think the thing to do is to understand the way that we work. So that's a good, because we didn't do that? Oh, why, because that would be a bad thing to do? No, because we are doing this. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll, I can give you a project who is doing this kind of stuff in a second. But um, the way we work is we, we work very bottom up, not just within the projects with the people that we have in the teams, but also within the project as a whole. So every, you know, nine months or something, we have a kind of call. And through our various networking events, teams form, and, and so they bring the problem to us. So it just so happened that no one came to us with chronic disease issues. So that was not something that we, we looked at, but it, it could just as easily be. Um, there is a project, though, in, in the UK called You Behave, um, which is a consortium, I think, of Southampton University, uh, Oxford, Nottingham, and then one of the London universities, and they are looking at this kind of stuff. Um, they're looking at behavior change um, in the kind of health context. I don't know if they're looking at diabetes specifically, um, but they, they are using, doing that kind of stuff, and they're, they're doing a lot with kind of mobile phones and sensors. Um, so that, that would be a good link if you're doing that kind of stuff. That was fascinating. I, I really enjoyed it. I think you guys have thought about a lot of issues, sort of you've pulled together a lot of issues that we've touched on in the iSchool in different ways, but you've really pulled it together kind of elegantly. Um, I, I have two sort of more logistical questions. One is you didn't actually say how far along you are in the project and, you know, what the final product will be. I'm very curious. Um, and the second thing is that it strikes me that this kind of work, I mean, we're seeing it pop up in the iSchool, you guys are doing it probably popping up in a lot of places, and I'm just curious if you have any sense of other places that are engaging. I mean, high schools in general sort of try to engage communities and do this kind yeah. of multidisciplinary work, but I'm just curious if you have a, you yeah. know, a wider periscope yeah. than I sure. do. Yeah, so the first question is easy. So it was originally funded for three years. We, are, we will come up to two years when we hit October, so next month we'll be through two years, so we'll have another year to run. Unfortunately, it's only three years, and like any funded project, we now have the challenge of trying to uh, continue. What's the final product? Well, the final product um, is a number of things. It's, it's the products of the individual sprints, and those are going on in their own direction. Um, but it's also um, a product about how to work across disciplines, which we, at some point, will distill what we've learned from Protein and write about that. Um, and it's, it's, the, it's the process that we followed and hopefully to write papers that can give hints on how to do this kind of project in general. So that, that's, that's the answer to the first question. The second question is, yes, I think there is, there is a trend towards getting out of the ivory tower and going to work um, with communities. Certainly, I, I've seen this um, within Lancaster. We've just got a new vice chancellor or president, I guess, provost maybe would be equivalent here. Uh, and he... He certainly is very keen for academics to kind of go out into the community. Um, and in fact, some disciplines do this anyway. So if you go to health and medicine, for example, they, that's how they work. You know, they, they have to. Um, what, and, and there's also been a lot of work done, certainly, and um, I think all over the place, but I know the work in the UK on kind of public engagement. So there was a, a really nice initiative that was started at Brighton University called CUP. And they actually set up an office in the, in the provost's building um, that would act as a kind of mediator between people in the community and academics. Uh, really nice. I wish we could do something like this at Lancaster. This would be my dream. What I would say, though, I think, I think the thing that makes Catalyst a little bit different is that it's fundamentally a research project. A lot of these things like CUP and these kind of, um, you know, engaging with the community things that you see, um, are they're either about communicating the, the research that's done in the university um, or they're about, you know, trying to support the communities in some way, um, you know, so they might, you know, I mean, so for example, if, if, if a team came to us in Catalyst and said, oh, we're a community group and we need a new website, can you build us one? Uh, we would not do that because it's not research. We might point them to some resources where it could be done. Um, 
and that has to be very clearly communicated, right? You know, because that's not necessarily what they expect. Um, so, you know, none of the prototypes that we built are in a state where you can just give them, you know, they are research prototypes. Um, so I think the thing that makes Catalyst a bit different is the, is, is the keeping the focus on the research. You know. So I used to work in a technology transfer office at a university, and so this seems like something that would be a everybody panic because we don't know how to handle it. And I think universities are getting much better at coming up with private incubators for technology so researchers can work with private companies. But as far as I know, I don't know any model that would support something like Catalyst. Um, in your experiences, I know you mentioned kind of working with the IP offices and everything else. Are there any kind of, would there be a good model for how, say, a university could support with these kind of proper, or kind of these policies so that you could get a finished product and could, you know, push that forward? Uh, from a kind of IP perspective. It, right. Or, yeah. you know, like I know the universities have like vested interest in terms of what, what your research is going, if you come up with something, yeah. typically they want their hands yeah. on it yeah. some way. Yeah, um, I don't know that there is a, a standard model. I mean, when, when we started this, we thought, oh, what we'll do, we'll go and talk to our contracts and our IP people, and we'll get some kind of standard contract drawn up. Um, it's just not possible, uh, at least not within my university. What we found we have to do is we have to have a bespoke agreement for every single project, which sounds like a lot of work. Um, but in practice, you know, it's not that much work. I mean, the nature of these projects is that, you know, I, th I think it's unlikely that anybody would make themselves rich out of any of these projects. They're community servicing projects rather than, you know, big dollar sign projects. So the university has not tried to hold on to the IP. Um, we've in, in, for specific projects, we've often set up kind of Creative Commons licenses or shared IP and things, and, and we encourage the community to take things forward in a social enterprise, for example, and the university has been pretty good at saying, you know, yeah, that's fine. Because um, they're savvy enough to know that, you know, there's no point stifling innovation by trying to hold on to every little thing. Um, you know, if they, they, they should, you know, if there's something that comes up that's gonna be the next Facebook or something, they might try and hold on to it, but we, we, we haven't done that yet, so, yeah. unfortunately. Hello, Hi. can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I had, uh, two questions about this Prote thing. Yeah. Uh, one is, uh, d generally, did everyone in the core group use Prote, or is it more just uh, a few, few people using it? Uh, we've done it different ways. So yeah, different ways. Um, it, it was, it was it, the, you, there was at least one Prote dialogue with the entire core team. Mm -hmm. um, what we didn't do so much was actually get the, some of the users involved in that, and maybe we should have done. Um, but we've also done smaller groups. We do it a bit kind of on demand, so the, the Prote dialogues get a sense of, you know, which of the people would benefit more from the Prote. Um, thing, but certainly th there are there are mandated ones where the project manager has to be involved and some of the key staff. Awesome. Um, but then you know some of the research have t taken up additional ones because there's things they wanted to point out. You know. Okay. Did it, um, did the Prodi did a uh, did using it ever uh, give any clarity or comfort to some of the decision making and management challenges? Or is it more just this kind of software on the side thing? No, I mean it's it's. Um, it's for me as a, as a kind of PI on this whole thing and, and also been involved in some of the projects, it's served a number of purposes. So, mm -hmm. I mean, at a very basic level, it's a really good way of documenting everything that we've learned in a way yeah. that I wouldn't have had time to do myself. Mm -hmm. But no, it's, it's, it, there are definitely also um, issues that were raised in the Prote dialogues that had never been raised outside. So it kind of, it definitely pointed out problems mm -hmm. and it definitely, you know, uh, made people feel better about the way things are going because they'd had a chance to kind of talk about it and everybody was on the same page. So, yeah, so I was just thinking, uh, sometimes just the sense of order and structure gives some comfort <laughs> or, or process. Even yeah, so or just yeah. the opportunity to yeah. kind of talk about it in a kind of open environment where, where you're, you're free to kind of share things. I mean, it's not without its issues. Um, I mean, there were two things that were a little bit problematic with it that we've had to try and adapt. Um, one is that it, was, it didn't fit the timescales very well. So what, what happens is that um, 
you know, the protee people um, write a report of the meeting and then they send that around to everybody and get their approval um, before that's communicated to people like myself. Because it, it's really important to build trust so that people mm -hmm. can feel they want to say anything. But that process can take quite a long time, right? You know, they, they go away from the meeting, they have to write it all up. Um, then they send it around by email, nobody replies, so they have to, you know, bother people. And eventually people say, no, you need to change this, this and this, that's not what I meant at all. Um, and if you're in a six to nine month project and that takes three months, it's too late to actually learn anything within the project. So what they're trying to experiment now is, is a much more agile, um, faster way of doing that, where they get kind of the highlights out very, very quickly. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, and then the other kind of slight issue that we had in one situation was because the dialogue is typically not one-on-one, -on -one, it's the team, there can be, although we try and make it an open sharing, you know, touchy-feely environment, uh, there can be people that um, don't, that there's stuff they want to say that they won't say in a group, you know, and that they want a one-on-one. -on -one. So sometimes you have to do kind of one-on-one -on -one if, if you really care about, you know, what that individual has to say. Um, what you're doing is really great. Um, so are you planning to collaborate with Berkeley? Uh, I would way? love to. <laughs> uh, part of the reason I'm here. Um, yeah, well, I mean, let me give you a, a, a good, a proper answer to that question. So most of the groups, the community groups that we've worked with so far have been very local to Lancaster. They've been within a kind of hour um, distance from Lancaster. And there's a number of reasons for that. One is because it's easier to do that. You know, they're there, you can talk to them face to face. Um, the second reason is that Lancaster is actually pretty good. It's full of community groups and activists doing all kinds of really good social stuff. So we've, there would be no reason to go anywhere else. Um, now, so in the first two years, we've had a kind of local focus, but in the last year and beyond, we would actually like to kind of extend beyond that. We're, all, we're already going to Scotland um, in a month. We're going to a remote Scottish island and doing a project about energy usage there. Um, and, and we are planning a kind of grand tour um, next year sometime where we'll go around various universities and talk about what we're doing and, 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 and hopefully collaborate with people who are interested or trying to do similar things. So yeah, I mean, I, w I would love to collaborate e even if it's just uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a very straightforward way or in a much more involved way, you know, I'd be very open to doing that. You know. Anybody feel free to talk to me about that. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, thank you for inviting me. As I said, I'm, I'm in the Bay Area until September 11th. I'm doing a little tour uh, going down to CMU Silicon Valley on next Tuesday to talk about something completely different, software engineering. Um, but, you know, if you, if you do, if this does pique your interest and you want to chat to me while I'm here, just send me an email and I'd be happy to come back up. So, thank you. <laughs>